Okay, awesome. I think. Can you guys see it? Yep. Okay, wonderful. Uh, all right. So, um, as I mentioned, my name is Neil D'Souza, uh, Ontario Private Mortgages, uh, powered by Dominion Lending Centers um, and uh, private lending. Uh, actually, you know, just before, let me just stop for a quick second. I just want to say something, guys. Um, when when it comes to private lending, it is one avenue of you know, a whole myriad of different ways to make money in real estate, uh, as you guys are well aware. And it has its place with with the whole portfolio. So you, you really have to know what you're trying to achieve. And that's probably the most important thing to start with, because um, there are people who do solely private lending. There are obviously people that do love multifamilies, people who love flipping and, you know, uh, Airbnbs and, uh, you know, Airbnb arbitrage and all these different ways, industrial real estate and private lending is one of these ways. Now, one of the things that I want to say about private lending is that um, you are, it's a, it's a passive strategy right? Where for the most part, you're sitting back and letting people like the banks, uh, like the banks do, they let, they lend you the money. And then they, of course, they, they just sit back and let you pay them. And, and private lending is very much the same deal. So um, now with that in mind, let's, let's get to this. All right. Uh, private lending 101. What what, how, and who? Uh, so where do we start? First of all, what is a private mortgage or what is private lending? How does it work? And who is it for? So uh, the easiest answer to what is private lending is it's a loan against real estate. Literally, I got that definition from, uh, from the gentleman, the distinguished gentleman here, Mr. Henry Priesman, the lawyer. It's literally just a loan against real estate. Um, but what is a, a mortgage? It, it really is, and this is going to sound funny, but it really is uh, made up of two words, uh, mort, which is the French for dead, and gage, which is uh, Latin for pledge. So it's literally a dead man's pledge. Uh, because when you would mortgage your property, you, you know, it takes you the rest of your life to pay that thing off. So, um, so what makes it private? It's really as simple as the difference between it coming from an individual versus coming from a bank. And uh, one of the things that is important to notice that private mortgages were actually done long before uh, financial ever financial uh, institutions ever uh, gave out a mortgage, considering that uh, banks are, of course, just about 100 years old. So uh okay so how does it work so first of all a private mortgage as we said it's a loan against real estate it's just the same as the banks do the difference is that you have to use your own money uh whether it's uh wherever you, your source of money is coming from um and there is this thing called position versus um versus priority oh whoever comes first gets paid first. And uh, so position is the first person to put in, put on a private mortgage or put on a mortgage would go in first position, whoever goes second, second position, so on and so forth. Um, now, that also establishes the priority of who gets paid. So typically, what we see is the bank's Normally, most people get money from the bank first, and so typically they're going to be in first position, and they're going to have first priority. And then, um, you know, we typically come in behind the banks, and we all put a second mortgage in. Now, the reasons are many, and we may get to that. But before we get to that, um, the reasons that that people do that, let, let's uh, get into a little bit of the, um, uh, you know, the downside of. <laughs> of a private mortgage and um what the power of a good lawyer is shown in the vagaries of law and the uncertainty of life and this is where i bring in uh 
my my lead counsel, my lead uh, solicitor, uh, Henry Priesman. Uh, Henry, would you like to take over? Sure, Neil. Uh, thank you for the uh, introduction. And uh, I think uh, Neil did a pretty good job of explaining what a private mortgage is. And I think we all understand why it can be lucrative for the people that lend the money for the lenders. Um, my job, and as you can see from the picture, Neil, has, he's got a, a glass of water. And I always joke that my job is to take cold water and pour it uh, over the hopes and dreams of all my clients. Um, now, that's a joke, but it does reflect, I think, the reality uh, of what a lawyer sometimes has to do. So Neil will explain to you and has started explaining to you why private mortgages are good, the positives, the upsides, the pluses. And my job is to talk about things that can go wrong. And there are a number of things that can go wrong if you are lending money on the security of a mortgage. As Neil's po pointed out, uh, a mortgage is a loan with a piece of real estate as collateral. So what can go wrong? Well, first of all, um, the borrower may not pay you back. Now that may reflect itself in not being or not receiving um, monthly payments if monthly payments are part of the mortgage deal. It may ref be reflected in not getting your principal back when the mortgage matures. So that is, you know, the most common risk. And that's one that people instinctively understand, right? You lend somebody some money, they don't pay you back. What do you do? And we'll talk about it in a second. But that's not the only one. There are other risks involved in, in private lending. Uh, the borrower can default in other ways. Uh, a couple of examples are the borrower doesn't keep up the insurance on the property that you have as collateral. That's part of every mortgage deal. And of course, insurance is important. If the property burns down, if it's destroyed, the value of the properties diminish significantly. So you want to make sure that there is insurance and there's insurance money that's available in case something happens to that property. The, pro the borrower may not pay the property taxes. Uh, that's bad for the lender because property taxes come ahead of any other loan against the property. The borrower may not pay their first mortgage if you're in second priority. Uh, and that's a default. So there's all kinds of things that can happen that could jeopardize your money, the security of your loan, right? And all these things are talked about in the loan contract and in the mortgage that's registered on title and so on. So these things do happen. And if you are a mortgage investor, if you're a private lender and you do it relatively frequently or regularly, not even frequently, but regularly, it will happen to you at some point. But that's okay uh, because if you've done it right, and Neil D'Souza will explain how to do it right in just a moment, you will get your money back and you will uh, be whole at the end of the process. So I, I've given you some of the standard risks, but you know, uh, recently life has um, given us even more. So for example, we had a, uh, an eviction moratorium in Ontario for a good period of time. So if you've lent money on a piece of property where there's a tenant, and you want to get the tenant out to sell the property so that you can get your money back, you can't because the government has passed legislation saying the tenants can't be evicted for a certain period of time. And in fact, what happened was not only were they not evicting tenants, they weren't evic evicting people who were owners that weren't paying their mortgages and living in the property because the police weren't enforcing court orders for writs of possession. It wasn't happening. So even these kinds of crazy things can happen and you don't expect them to happen. The key is the margin of safety. And Neil will talk about that um, in a few moments. So how do you get your money back if your borrower doesn't pay? Well, we have two main remedies here in this province. Um, one is called power of sale and one is called foreclosure. Now, if you listen to news or read financial news, 
from the United States, you might confuse the two, okay? Because they refer to everything as foreclosure. We don't have the same kind of terminology. So let me give you like a little um, explanation of how the two differ. A power of sale allows the lender who has a mortgage in default to sell the property that is the security for the loan to recoup their money and their costs, right? So you, let's say you lend somebody $100,000, you've got a property of security, they don't pay, you sell the property and you can recoup the $100,000 that you've invested plus whatever interest you haven't been paid plus the real estate costs that you've incurred plus your lawyer's fees, plus, plus, plus. Whatever it is that you've spent enforcing your security is recoverable from this borrower or from the sale of the property. And the, the great thing about power of sale is you don't need a court order. You don't need a judge to sign off on anything. You don't necessarily need to sue or file a court application. You might even be able to do this without ever filing a piece of paper in a courthouse. Okay. And that's why the power of sale remedy is the preferred one, right? You sell the property, you get all your money back, you get all your interest back, get your costs back. If there's anything left over, it goes to whoever comes next in priority and you go on your merry way and you can keep investing whenever you wanna invest in. So I would say nine out of 10 at least of any mortgage defaults go power the power of sale route. The foreclosure on the other hand is when you become the owner of the property after the loan defaults. In other words, you trade your loan for the ownership, the title to the property. You become the owner, the loan is extinguished, it no longer exists. It's a quid pro quo. The lender exchanges the indebtedness for the title to the property. Now this is a lengthier process and it does require a court order. You have to sue, you have to get a judge to sign off. That's how you get titled from the court order. So that's not something that people um, really uh, want to pursue. Uh, less than 10% of mortgage defaults go the foreclosure route. And there are other technical reasons why lenders don't want to go that route. But we'll, you know, uh, today's probably not the place to talk about those. So if you do have a default and you decide you're going to sell the property under power of sale, okay, how, what does the process look like? So let me give you a quick overview. First of all, after the default happens, whatever it is, whether it's non-payment, uh, insurance is um, lapsed, taxes aren't paid, you have to wait 15 days before you can start any process, okay? 15 calendar days. After those 15 calendar days from default elapse, then you can issue um, a legal document called a notice of sale. And a notice of sale starts the power sale process. It goes by registered mail to the borrower and maybe other parties saying, you owe me this money, you haven't paid, and my intention is to sell your property to recoup my money. And once that goes out by registered mail, by law, you have to give the borrower 35 days to pay you out whether they can borrow the money from somewhere else, whether they sell the property, whether they get the money from mom and dad or grandpa, it doesn't matter. If they come up with the money within that 35 days, the power sale process stops. If it doesn't, and you don't get paid, then you can begin selling the property. If the property is vacant, or if it's a piece of raw land, or if it's a commercial building, you can probably put it on the market right away. Sometimes though, you have to get vacant possession. You have to get the people out and that requires a little more time and elbow grease, okay? So these days in our COVID situation, we're looking at about seven to eight months from the beginning of the process to the end. In other words, from default to the time that you sell the property or are in a position to sell the property. And that's a little bit longer than it used to be, right? It used to be about, four to five months, but because of court backlogs and delays and other uh, vagaries of life, um, we have to wait longer. So you have to have the intestinal fortitude, the ability to wait. If you're relying on those interest payments, 
to uh, pay your bills or if you need that principal back because you've got a commitment, you've got a house to close on or an operation to pay for or whatever else you need money for, you can't commit that money to a private mortgage because you just don't know. You just don't know. And, you know, a, a lot of lenders have been bailed out by a rising market. But there's no guarantee that the market will rise forever or that it will continue to rise for the next year or two. Uh, markets can fall. So if you've lent money based on a certain valuation and the market falls by 20 or 25 percent, you might have a problem. Right. As all investors in any real estate would have the same problem. So you have to think about all these risks and you have to be prepared for a process that may take up to a year to get your money back. Now, if you've invested and you've got the margin of safety and there's value in the property, you will get your money back. Um, but you've got to be able to, um, to forego those payments for that period of time. I, I don't know, do you want me, um, anything else that you want me to cover, Neil, or any other? No, I think that's great. We, we're probably going to have some Q and A's after, and so uh, sure. people have some questions for you. Um, sure. So, so that uh, that's good. I, I um, one of the things that I'd like to point out at this point is for you, for those of you that are watching this, that are real estate investors, if you do not have a lawyer, a real estate lawyer that you know, like, and trust, you are setting yourself up for failure. You need to be able to have someone that you can call when there are issues, legal issues, so you can, um, you can navigate those things and ideally navigate them before the events occur and, and transpire. Um, you know, one of the things that um, I can say as as a matter of fact, I can say this, um, you know, I can say that if not for having, in my case, having uh, Henry as as a lawyer to ask questions, there are aspects of private lending that I would never have learned along the way and um, and that I wouldn't have been able to go on and then teach other people about. Right. And so obviously uh, there's a number of things that I'm here and I can share with you and teach you guys. But in your real estate journey, you must, you must build a team. I think Diana talked about this when she uh, uh, earlier, I think last week, uh, she, she had talked about this and um, no, actually that was this week. That was this week. <laughs> Diana was talking about it and the need to build a team. And so I, I really want to uh, point that out because as a safe and secure as a, an investment, as private lending is, Real estate in and of itself is um, is one where you need to build a team. So, uh, Henry, thank you very much. Um, we'll we'll come back to you and um, let's just quickly see here. Uh, Alex says very thorough. Thanks, Henry. Okay, and uh, let's go back to our slides. So, a um, couple of things that Henry talked about. One of the things was he talked about loan to value. And I don't actually have that in my slides, so I'll just hold off on that. But um, I'm going back there. Loan to value is the amount of the mortgage versus the value of the property. So if you give a for first mortgage, if the property value is $100,000, you found a $100,000 house um, and you're lending $50,000 as a first mortgage, then then uh, $50,000, $100,000 mortgage, that's 50% loan to value. Um, and, uh, and we know the banks, of course, standard is to go to 80%. Of course, high ratio mortgages, they will go much higher. And of course, we know first time buyers, you can put 5% down. Once upon a time, there was a thing where you could get 100% and they would even give you money um, on top of that. Um, sorry. Um, 
other people from my generation uh, took advantage of that and uh, hurt a lot of people. So they changed those rules and you can't get that anymore by normal means. But, um, you know, it's a great story that you, you'll you hear from some old people. <laughs> so, <laughs> so loan to value. All right. Now, now here's the question. It's kind of like, this is kind of like, uh, you know, I don't know about you guys, when when you're a kid and you're going for Halloween, people tell you, you go to people's houses and they're going to give you candy. You're going to knock on the door. You're going to open a bag and they're going to put candy into your bag. And you're sitting there. And I think Seinfeld said this. He was like, who are these people? These crazy people that are giving away the candy. Well, you might ask, who are these people that are borrowing the money and giving us, giving it to us, uh, giving us money back. And uh, you would be asking, you know, who's borrowing the money? Who borrows private money? Well, there's a lot of different people. Uh, some of you here I know are uh, uh, love private lending. You've borrowed money yourself. You use it. You abuse it. You, uh, you create your own wealth with it. Um, I honestly, I do as well. So investors absolutely are using private money. And uh, one of the reasons that they're using private money is they can get in to properties without a lot of questions. They don't have to go through the same qualifying procedures that you do with the bank. So people are doing rentals, uh, income properties, they're doing flips, they're doing uh, in situations where they need to do quick closing. Um, you know, the bank has fallen through, the bank couldn't do it in time. And so they, they jump in there and uh, they get ahead of the queue. I can tell you this, I have literally told some realtors who have said, oh, this property is gone. Uh, this other person uh, won it and, uh, and they've taken the property and they're going to be closing on it. And I kid you not, I've spoken to them and I said, well, when when they can't close on the property, call me back and I'll close. And the reason being that I can walk around like that is I know that I can turn around and get private money to be able to close on that property. Now, it costs something, which we can talk about afterwards. But um, if you've done your proper due diligence, then even you as an investor can use private money for that. Uh, one of the things that we see a lot is debt consolidation. Um, people during COVID, you know, people were deferring, deferring uh, different debts that they had, and they were trying to get caught up. And so they would do debt consolidations. But for years, we've seen people doing debt consolidation loans. When you think about it, a credit card, 29%, Fairstone, Easy Financial, all of these guys, 30, 40%. If you borrow any of that money and it's absolutely ridiculous. So all of a sudden, when we come in and offer them a private second mortgage, you know, you're cutting their bills in half, basically. So you're, uh, you're really doing some of these people a favor and you're able to help restructure, repair their credit, get them back to a financial institution with those historically low rates, like uh, these two and three and 4% uh, interest mortgages. So Oh yes, credit issues. Yeah, repairing repairing credit from bankruptcies, consumer proposals. We get into all of these things. Again, all of this is because it's all secured against um, real estate, so we can feel comfortable to lend. Oh yes, successful investors are consistent. Um, we are not looking for a home run. When you're talking about private lending, we're not looking for a home run on every deal. You're looking for consistent money. Uh, that's what private lending is. I can tell you that there are entire cultural communities that, um, you know, they they lend out consistently and their money is out there, honestly, at like 6%. And they do it steady and they, they're not worried. They don't want... They don't want the highest risk or any of that kind of stuff. Their money is just consistently out there. And um, over lifetimes, you know, doing that kind of consistency just uh, builds up a resiliency, builds up a pot of money that, um, 
you, you don't really worry about all the other things. You don't worry about COVID. You don't worry about these things. So they're consistent about trying to stay and keep a steady return. Now, for most of us, we may not have that large pot of money. And so you're building. So you take a little bit more. You, you do a second mortgage rather than a first mortgage, and you take a higher rate of interest. Um, and so there are a lot of people that do that. Now, I'll say this um, before I go any further about that. The higher you go on that loan to value, the higher you should be able to expect on an interest payment. And um, the last year and a half during COVID, uh, private lending has taken a huge hit because there's so much cheap money out there. And so a lot of people have been refinancing and paying out all of their debts. And so where we would have averaged high double digits, you know, now you're seeing a much more modest uh, return on that. So, so that's, that's something to consider. But as you go higher in your loan to value, as the person has less and less, what do they call it? Skin in the game. Uh, you, you know, you you need to be aware that uh, it's easier and easier for them to um, not be worried about about not being able to fulfill that that loan. So uh, typically, we we go up to about eighty five percent loan to value max. Um, there are the odd times that I can say, especially with investors who you know have a good track record, you can feel a lot more comfortable to maybe even go up to one hundred percent because they're doing a flip and you know, who, you know them, you have a track record with them. They've got other assets. They can make sure they can pay you back. Uh, these kind of things. Or sometimes you can do something called uh, collateral or blanket mortgage where you can go up, let's say the value of your property is a hundred thousand and, or the property you're buying is a hundred thousand and they lend you a hundred thousand, but they also give collateral on another building another property. And overall, it lowers your loan to value, as I mentioned. Um, you know, so there's, there's ways to do that as well. Okay, I don't want to get too far into those weeds. But uh, this slide basically talks about, first of all, it's secured, you're secured against real estate, it's contracted, you have a contracted interest rate. So you know what your return is going to be, it's going to be six, seven, eight, 10, 12, 13, 14%, whatever it is, you know what your contracted interest rate is going to be. And the government of Canada, thank you, O Canada, they uh, allow us to even use RRSPs, Liras, all of these types to be able to invest in real estate. A lot of uh, funds that perhaps normally would um, be underutilized that we get to use them. So that's uh, RSPs eligible. Oh, okay, here we go. That's me. And uh, some places you can find me. I've got lots of material out there. A lot of stuff on uh, TikTok, on Facebook, on Instagram, you can, you can find me and, um, you know, learn more about private lending. And of course, you can reach out to me and there's my contact info. So I'll stop that. And, uh, and Diana, why don't we open it up for questions? questions? What do you think? Yeah, no, yeah, I think that's great. For does either anyone... Henry or I, just let, let us know what you'd like us to. Yeah, does anyone uh, have any questions? You can just unmute yourself in chat or you can uh, put up your hand, whichever way. <laughs> I have, I have a, a question. question. Oh, I'll... Somebody else has a question. I'll let, I'll let them go first. Okay, sure. Alec, you want to go first and then and then Kai after? Uh, yeah, great. Um, hi. So I have a question for uh, Henry. Um, I just wanted to know an example of, uh, just so I can wrap my head around some of the things you were saying of like a private lender giving let's say 85 percent loan to value um let's call it on a hundred thousand dollar property so they give eighty five thousand, and then uh let's say a year goes by and the property is now worth uh, 120 thousand, and then they default would that lender not have the option to do some sort of refinance situation 
or do you think that they wouldn't do that because um, maybe they're adverse to continue lending to this uh, individual or you know situation? Are, are you asking if the lender has the option to renew the mortgage for a further term? Yeah, and uh, what options do they have, and why wouldn't they do that? Well, I mean, they have the option to do that if, if they can agree with the borrowers to the term. So let's say the year is over, properties appreciate in value, the lender's happy to keep their money invested, the borrower's happy to keep paying, they can renew the mortgage for another year, for six months, whatever they agree to. It's not a problem. As long as they can agree to that and they agree to the interest rate and they agree to the extension term, it can, it can continue on uh, until the, uh, either the lender demands their money back or the borrower pays them back. So there's, there's no impediment to that happening, okay? Uh, some of the reasons the, the lender may want their money back, they may have a better investment that they wanna put their money into, or they may need their money for another purchase. They bought a property, they bought a cottage, they want to move up to a bigger house. Uh, they want to buy a Rolls Royce. I don't know. The, the, uh, uh, the things people do with their money are many. Um, but if the, if the lender wants their money back for whatever reason, then the borrower's got to come up with it or they're in default. Okay? But to answer your question, can they extend or renew for another term? Yeah. As long as everybody's in agreement, no problem. Thanks. I hope I answered your question. I'm not sure, but I, I hope I tried. Yep, that was great. Thank you. Kai, would you like to come on and ask yours? Sure. Uh, thanks a lot for the information, Neil. Uh, question for you, Henry. What's the legislation and uh, power cell process like in New Brunswick and uh, Quebec? I have no idea. Uh, I've never practiced in New Brunswick and Quebec. Quebec is a different kettle of fish altogether. They're in the civil law system. So I, I wouldn't even hazard a guess. Um, my understanding of the Atlantic provinces is, is that the system is relatively similar to what we have here. But I'm not, I'm not called in New Brunswick. I don't practice in New Brunswick. I've been to New Brunswick once, uh, 30 odd years ago. Mm. So I'm certainly not the person to ask about what happens in New Brunswick. I can give you Ontario answers, but you'd have to ask somebody who's called there. Okay. Well, let, let me, let me just answer. I'm not going to fully answer that question, but I can tell you that I, I, I do lend out in New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. I've lent in Quebec as well and um, about to lend in uh, Saskatchewan as well. Um, and the systems are very similar, um, if not identical in most of these places. The, what you see in the differences is really the timelines it, more, more so. Now, Quebec is a bit of a different, um, you know, area, <laughs> different region, because you do have to deal with some other uh, family law that, that's involved. And so uh, I, I don't want to say too much of that. Plus, you, you've got to deal with, with uh, translation and, and the like. But uh, for the other provinces, for the most part, it's, it's very similar. Now, one thing I can say about Saskatchewan um, is, and, and Alberta, um, I can say about these places, is that because their markets have fluctuated um, so much because of the oil, oil and gas industry, um, they are a lot more favorable towards foreclosure uh, as opposed to here we're much as Henry was mentioning a lot more likely to uh, move to a power of sale um, whereas in some of these places they're they're a little bit they, they're not going to push it as much if you request a foreclosure so Neil in uh, in New Brunswick is the process going to be longer than here in Ontario or it's going to be shorter oh well the, it, well then there's a whole bunch of other questions that along that line that I can't really answer, right? Because there's, when you're saying longer, the timelines are, are uh, virtually identical. I can't remember the exact number of days, but I can tell you that they're, they're virtually identical. But the difference in every situation, as Henry could probably tell you, is 
you know, there could be all sorts of differences that, that come up um, in the procedure. Someone's about to pay you off. So you, you hold off and then they don't pay you and then you go back and, you know. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll give you a brief COVID. example. Um, if you're, if you've got a, a piece of property, that's vacant land, it's a piece of land with no dwelling and that's your security and the borrower defaults, your ability to sell that property is it's a lot easier to sell it because you don't have any tenants. You don't have any occupants. You have a dwelling. Nobody has to, you, you know, you don't have to show it. You can sell that fast. If you're selling a multi uh, residence building and you've got to assign all the tenants and you've got, you know, residential tenancy issues and you need inspections and the buyer has to go in and look at it and the bank has to appraise it. You got a longer timeline, right? So I'm not sure it's the legislation that you need to worry about. I think it's the kind of property that you're lending on that you need to worry about more than anything. Yeah. Okay, let's say it's a single family residential. So the market value, it's, uh, it's decent. Um, but do I have to get uh, um, the tenants out before I can uh, pop sell it or I can keep the tenant the way it is? Depends on the buyer. If the buyer has agreed to accept the tenant, then you can keep the tenant in place. Most buyers want the tenant out. So the vast majority of the time, you'll have to get whoever's living there, whether it's owner or tenant, out before you can close on your deal. Like you can enter into, the agree into an agreement with the buyer to sell, but it's usually going to be conditional upon you getting the occupant of the property out before you close. I've, I've got a great uh, I've got a great one that we dealt with, and uh, Henry found himself out of this situation. I unfortunately had to deal with another lawyer who wasn't as savvy, but I can tell you guys I had a situation um, going into COVID. We had a we had four properties. A deal had four properties that were that had a collateral. So we gave we gave a private mortgage against the one property but we used the other three properties as security. And uh, going before COVID, we were, they, they weren't paying us. And, and we said, all right, we're, we're gonna have to move forward. And then COVID hit. And one of the properties was a piece of land. Two of them were houses. And then one was a, um, you know, a building. Um, a uh, an office building and of course with the moratorium that henry was talking about you couldn't move people out you couldn't do any of those things the building nobody was going to the building so the value of the building dropped uh it got cut in half the value of it got cut in half um over two million dollars worth of equity disappeared like that and uh because of covid and we had to sit tight and figure out what was going on. Plus the court system was closed. So we had to kind of sit tight and figure out what was going on. Um, and everyone, everyone stayed calm and uh, held on and waited till later on in the year when the courts reopened and, and the market started going again. Now, once the market started going in to answer to your question about what if people are still in there, we did put the, the houses up for sale immediately. For power of sale and um with the people in it we didn't ask them to get out with the people in it and uh just the the threat of doing that the uh the individual came up with the money and we got paid everyone made their money and and uh the extra for the for the headaches that they put us through and we got out that's not always the case um but but we were able to do that. So can you put it up for sale with people still in there? Yes. I can't speak to that towards New Brunswick, but I can tell you that we ran into that situation in Ontario. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. That was great to hear. Does anyone else have any other questions? Yeah, I've got a, I've got a question real quick. Sure, go ahead, Sean. Okay, so when it when it comes to when it comes to private lending, um, how how are these agreements tied into the agreement of purchase and sale? Is it like a separate document, or is it written 
in the agreement as a as a clause the the negotiation of the terms and things like that it it's a it's a mortgage agreement it's a separate document and uh for most private lenders you'll you know it's like a two three page document with the general terms you provide it to your it, it of course gets signed by whoever is accepting the mortgage and uh, so you take that mortgage commitment and then you give it to the lawyer and uh, Henry here would of course draft all of the instructions with all of the other terms all of the uh, all of the other items that that go with it and and then it gets passed over just the same way that the banks would give you just a one two page document for for signing and then of course through the lawyers they give you the other thousand documents that they want you to sign your life away and your firstborn and <laughs> but yes okay. so there are two separate documents one is regarding the purchase of the property and the other is regarding financing of the property okay thank you so it's written in the in the mortgage agreement those terms that you uh, yes that yeah you two separate contracts okay. awesome thank you Neil. great question anyone else have any other questions that they would like to ask i have a question if you if um i don't know either one both give an example of uh uh going through like an actual power of a sale, like an example you saw in the past and, and like, what was the duration? Like, what was the, like, what was just the steps like to go through the power of sale and, and um, I don't know what, it, like expenses that you can expense out or just like how, how that whole process worked. I don't know if, or I guess that's more of a Henry let, question, I guess. Well, let me, add. let me go <laughs> first. Let me go first, okay. Henry. Let me go first because, um, I've never, I've never had to go through it. Um, we, we get there and quite honestly, the moment we, we, uh, threaten any of those things, typically it's, it's said and done. And as far as we've gotten is sending out the notice and then, uh, people pay really quickly. If you make sure that you leave equity in the property, that's, that's been my experience. Now, Henry, on the other hand, and the reason that uh, I love this man is because he's got extensive experience in uh, in such things. And I'll let him speak to you about that. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I've got a lot of examples. Um, when I started practicing in 1992, uh, you know, by the looks of everyone here, you're too young to remember 1992. But I'll tell you kids something about 1992. Uh, it was a really bad real estate market. The market had crashed in 1990. And... By that time, everything was power sale. Every other real estate transaction was being sold under power sale. That's just the way it was. Um, so when I started practicing, that's all I did was power sale because that's all there was to do. Um, so I cut my teeth early and often on this on this process. So there, there's lots of examples. I mean, look, uh, some power sales are quick and dirty. You can get them done in two months. You know, vacant property, piece of land, and maybe a cottage something that doesn't require an eviction, uh, something where the borrower is cooperating because they have incentive to do so. Um, sometimes even a matrimonial split will result in whoever stayed in the house cooperating with you because they're only losing half. And if the other person, they're okay to lose their half as long as the other so-and-so loses his or her half, right? So you can point to all kinds of examples. Um, and there have been situations where you know, it's lasted over a year, 18 months. Um, there's litigation, there's all kinds of finger pointing. Those are, those are rare, uh, but they certainly happen. Uh, the most recent one I had was a house in North York. My client was a second mortgagee. Um, it was tenanted uh, and uh, the first mortgage and the second mortgage went into default. The first mortgage was held by somebody else. They went into default. The first mortgage lender issued power of sale and they were owed, you know, like $700,000. It was fortunate for us that my client had the money to pay off the first mortgage, take it over, and then we had the flexibility to do what we wanted to do under power of sale, right? And he got lucky because the market kept going up and up and up, 
And the borrower realizing this said, oh my God, I better redeem. So he um, came up with the money from somewhere, I don't remember where, and paid my guy off, right? A rising market, as we talked about earlier, Neil, lifts all boats. Whether it's the owner, whether you're an investor in the actual piece of property or whether you're a lender, because if your LTV is 70% today and the market goes up by 20%, well, you're sitting pretty, right? Because your LTV has just improved dramatically and you're still getting the same interest rate that you contracted for at the beginning of the deal. And that's what a lot of pre-COVID lenders have experienced. People were scared and then the market went up against all expectations. So, you know, um, you, you don't know, you hope the market continues to inch up with inflation, um, but, uh, that's why you've, you've got to leave yourself that margin of safety, a margin of error, right? You've got to be smart enough not to over lend and not to over leverage the property because experience has shown that if the borrower still has skin in the game, if they got something to lose, they'll do whatever they need to do. Sell the property, refinance, borrow, beg and steal the money to pay you off. But if they're in like 90% loan to value and they know they have nothing uh, to gain by paying you out, they're just going to let it go and you're going to lose, right? So in that way, leaving equity for the borrower to lose is very important for you as a lender. You got to be smart about how much you're prepared to lend on any property. Some people will actually use it as a, as a real estate strategy there if you've got the funds available some people will actually do it because like i I've, I've had people over covid um asking me if there are any properties that are um that are power of sale because we've seen that homes are going for so much over asking that they're looking for the opportunity to buy one you know hey i'll buy that debt and then I'll try to close on it and I get it at a discount um, if I can. And so there have definitely been people that have uh, been looking at that as a strategy or sometimes when the market is quiet and people know, hey, I'm not going to be able to get as much for it, they, they will literally use it as a strategy. It's not one that I recommend. You, you probably have to have money or you have to have people with money to be able to do that strategy, but um, there are definitely... Um, uh, you know, great whites swimming around. Listen, Neil, that, you, Neil you, you and I both know people who uh, who lend money, over lend a little bit to generate these defaults. Yeah. Right. And that's yeah. how they acquire yeah. properties for themselves. Um, yeah. Which, you know, it's not ethical in my opinion. And I don't recommend anyone do it. It's a very sophisticated strategy. Yeah. You really have to have a lot of money and you have to have a really good sense of the market. Um, you really have to be a sharp. And you have, to have, you have to be the kind of person who can, you know, sell their mother down the river for a couple bucks. Um, but they're, they're out there. And you know who I'm talking yeah. about, too. Right? Yeah. Oh, yes. I, well, I know. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Extremely sophisticated individual, too. Um, you yeah. know, he, he, he knows what he's doing and he's not shy about it. But uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and uh, so Alec had a question. He just wanted to know a little bit more about uh, generating defaults. Because Alec would sell his <laughs> uh, mother. <laughs> you know what I what I would say to, to that is um, before you know you get into the weeds of generating defaults, and generating defaults requires, um, you know, first of all, you have to have a deal stream, right? You have to. Have, like a, a lot of deals being brought that you can look over because it doesn't work for every deal. It's got to be a specific kind of deal. And before you really try to do that or think about doing that or look at deals of that nature, you really have to get your feet wet on regular, what I call regular mortgage lending. Like do it, get a decent borrower with a decent property, you know, invest, lend, get your money back, get your interest, do that a few times so that you get a sense of what it is and how it works, right? It's like getting your driver's license and getting into a Formula One race car as the first car you drive, right? It's gonna end badly, 
So you've got to move up, you know, first drive your dad's station wagon, then get your own car, then maybe get a race car. You know, you got to move up uh, the food chain if you want to do that kind of sophisticated lending and investing. And frankly, you know, it's, I don't know, part of it is, is learned, but part of it's like a gift. I think he has a gift, right? Yeah. It's got the sense, yeah. I don't know, you know, like sharks can smell blood. Uh, apparently in the water, like one drop of blood a mile away. It's almost like that, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Learning to recognize, if you see enough deals, you learn to recognize uh, what someone looks like, like what the, what the borrower looks like that is going to uh, repay you and is not. Uh, and it's one of the things that I'm able to literally offer my client is that I've seen so many deals that, that I learned, I've learned a feel for, for seeing the borrowers and and I just can discard those files before we get there. Not having said that, it's not like uh, I've I don't uh, miss some, but you know it's not like I've got a hundred percent. But but the reality is that you can get a feel for what what that looks like, what it should look like. Yeah, and I think one of, one of the good things I think that we do is uh, we can often keep people like that, provided that they qualify for loans and other criteria we can keep people like that away from these kinds of people right like it, it, we, nobody wants to see someone who can who uh, has their equity chewed up and, um, with fees and lending and all kinds of crazy terms uh, and tie tie backs like you know make your money the right way you know do it honestly do it um, with full disclosure charge people a fair amount of money for what you're you're lending to them, charge them a fair fee. And I, I think in the long run, you'll be better off. I, I really believe that. You don't need to, to play that game, you, even, uh, even though it's a very risky game to play. If you don't, if you, you need de- you know, at least a decade of experience, in my opinion, to even start. Awesome. Thank you so much. That was so interesting to hear that. Um, thank you. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Henry. That was, this was great. I think everyone got a lot of value from it.